Hello, on this edition of Commuter Connections, we'll introduce you to a couple of exciting additions to Mark Train service. We've got a look at the MTA Charm Card and MTA external and internal outreach that's making a difference in transit. Also, a look at Maryland's B&O Railroad Museum, all right here. MTA TV, the recipient of a 2015 Tele Award for television excellence. I'm Sandy Arnett. Welcome to Commuter Connections. MTA is dedicated to providing safe, efficient, and reliable world-class transportation on all its services, including Mark Rail, where two new exciting things have been added to service there. New bi-level train cars, which are a hit with passengers, and additional bike train cars on the Mark Penn line. Joining us with more on both is Mark's Assistant Chief Transportation Officer, Dave Johnson. Dave, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sandy. Now, Mark has had bi-level cars in its stock for some time now. How do these new trains differ from the ones that are already currently in the system? We've had bi-level cars uh, in the Mark Rail service since 2000, our original set we purchased uh, in 2000. These new cars, which we've recently acquired, are similar in design. They Passengers enter on the middle level and then go mm -hmm. either up or downstairs for most of the seating on the cars. Uh, the new cars have several additional features, including electrical outlets at every seat, larger restrooms, uh, automated public address systems, uh, as well as uh, energy efficient lighting. Uh, all lighting on board the cars is LED. Uh, we also have, uh, of course the cars being brand new, have uh, new uh, heating, air conditioning, ventilation systems and uh, are much more reliable. And how many, roughly how many trains of the new rail cars are have you have been purchased? We purchased 54 cars from uh, Bombardier Transportation. Uh, they uh, complement cars that are built uh, for New Jersey Transit up in the New York City area. We were able to partner with New Jersey Transit in purchasing these cars, mm. uh, which saved Maryland taxpayers money and also got us the cars uh, more quickly than had we gone off and made our own order. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So roughly how much are we talking? How the, much are the, the cars? 54 rail cars were $160 million. Okay. Uh, and so that's roughly about uh, three to four million dollars per car. Oh, okay, great, great. So it's something that Mark riders have something to look forward to. Absolutely, uh, they're, uh, they're, we're getting very positive reviews on the cars and the passengers like seeing uh, new equipment out on the service. Okay, great. So how often are the trains running with the new cars on we the run, line? Uh, m the new cars are primarily running on the Camden and Brunswick line um, and they also operate on the midday uh, service on the Penn line. Uh, what that has done is it's allowed us to take our other bi-level cars and put them all on the Penn Line rush hour service, so that's reduced crowding on those services as well, and mm -hmm. also provided uh, really needed capacity on the Brunswick and Camden lines. Uh, many of those trains had uh, uh, numerous standees and were very, very crowded now that everyone is able to have a seat and they're uh, much less crowded than they used to be. Great. So roughly how many people would you say ride the Mark service on uh, we, Camden? Um, Brunswick or the Penn line? Correct. We carry about uh, 36,000 passengers a day uh, between the Penn, uh, Camden, and Brunswick lines. Okay. Uh, Penn line is roughly about uh, 20, uh, 22, 23,000. Camden line around uh, 4,000 and Brunswick around 8,000. Okay, great, great. So it's something definitely new to look forward to. Absolutely. And I understand too that you're adding bike cars. Yes, we are. Onto uh, the Mark train. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, as uh, the new, it, it's kind of tied into the new rail cars, and that as the new rail cars have come into service, we've been able to take our old, uh, older single level equipment, which was purchased in the uh, mid 80s, um, the single level rail cars, refurbish them, mm -hmm. uh, give them a, a, a full overhaul, and in the process, uh, install uh, bike racks and seating for passengers to uh, sit with their bicycles on the rail car. The bike car has been, uh, or, or Mark providing bicycle service, full-size bicycle service has been requested for a long time by our passengers and this has allowed us to fulfill that need uh, and also provide it in a safe, uh, safe and efficient manner. I was going to ask you how did the bike car come about um, and it sounds like it's because riders were mm -hmm, requested. Absolutely. What did they do in, in the beginning, like before the official bike car was installed? Well, for, for a long time now, Mark Train has allowed collapsible bicycles, those bicycles that fold oh, okay. up, such as a Brompton mm -hmm. or other uh, 
uh, compact bicycle. They've been allowed on marked trains for, for a long time. Uh, however, the existing uh, rail car, rail equipment did not have space for non-collapsing bicycles. So um, through request of the bicycle advocacy community, commuters, and others, uh, we uh, had an idea for years to do a bike car. Unfortunately, we didn't have the spare equipment to do it. Mm -hmm. Now we have, with the, uh, with the uh, new cars coming into service, again, we're able to take our older single-level cars, uh, refurbish them, and provide space for, um, for bikes, uh, secure bike racks so that the uh, non-folding bicycles can be accommodated on the trains. Great. So will passengers be able to ride in the same car with their bikes, or is this the car just strictly for the, you know, with the bike racks where people can leave? No, there is, uh, the, there's seating in the cars. Uh, for those that are familiar with our equipment, the single-level cars used to have uh, three seats on one side and two seats on the mm, other side. I remember those, yes. yes. The, uh, mm -hmm. the three seats have been removed, and that's where the bike racks have been installed. The two seats uh, remain. They were not removed, and they still are there for passengers to sit uh, adjacent to their bicycle. Now, for people who want to come on and maybe take the train from Penn Station in Baltimore mm -hmm. down to Union Station mm -hmm. in D.C., is there any cost, additional fee, for those who want to bring their bikes on the train? No, there is no additional cost to bring your bike. You just need to purchase your, your mark ticket. Uh, okay. uh, it's uh, $8 one way from Penn Station to Washington. Mm -hmm. um, weekly and monthly tickets, of course, are, are honored as well. Um, and uh, the, the bike car is currently only available on the weekend service. Uh, we do okay. have plans, uh, long range, not specific plans yet, to inaugurate some limited bike car service on the weekdays. Uh, we're still working oh, okay. uh, out the details of that, but uh, eventually we should have some uh, bike service available on the weekday trains, and there will be no additional charge at that time either. And that would be great, because I'm sure mm -hmm. many people would like to ride their bikes or Absolutely. be able to at least get close to work and be able to ride their bikes Absolutely. in. And it would save on gas, right? Abs That's absolutely. Why we always absolutely. push for. So we've had uh, our, uh, the recent improvement with the bike car. Bike cars have been in service since December of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, the most recent improvement is that uh, an additional bike car uh, was was refurbished. Now we have enough to operate uh, the bike car on all trains on Sunday, and uh, six of nine trains on Saturday. Okay. And we've seen immediate results. Uh, the first weekend uh, that we ran the uh, the improved bike service, we uh, doubled our bike ridership uh, in, in the, on the first weekend. So there was uh, so the word uh, is getting the out. The word is getting out. There's mm -hmm. excellent response, and uh, passengers are using the service. That's great. So now, if someone wants to find out more information about Mark Train Service, mm -hmm. you know the hours, the schedules, the costs, what's available, like the bike bike cars. How can they get more information? Well, the best thing to do is to go to the MTA website, uh, www.mta.maryland.gov. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to the home page there, and on the uh, left-hand side, there's a link for Mark Train with uh, full information, schedules, fares, bike car, uh, other information uh, about the Mark Train service. Great, great. Well, thank you again for joining us. This is very helpful. Right, thank you for having me. As part of providing safe, efficient, and reliable world-class transit service, MTA has been reaching out to both external and internal transit stakeholders for their input and thoughts on how transit service can be improved. For some time, Baltimore residents have endured a disconnected and disjointed transit system. The decision not to move forward with a multi-billion dollar east-west light rail line has provided MTA an opportunity to meet and work closely with citizens, elected officials, and transit stakeholders on a more comprehensive transit solution for Baltimore City. Under the leadership of Governor Larry Hogan and Transportation Secretary Pete Ron, MTA Administrator Paul Comfort and senior MDOT officials have been meeting with citizens and stakeholders to listen and identify their top priorities to fix the transit system in Baltimore. I've ridden all the services and listened to passengers. I've met with groups like Transit Choices and other groups who are um, what I would call transit advocacy groups. We've had stakeholder meetings where we went out to the community. Last week I went out in West Baltimore and had like a town hall meeting where we had legislators come from the city, from the state, and users of the service and asked them, told them kind of what we're working on and asked them for their input. The meeting, spread out over a course of several months, has provided MTA an opportunity not only to listen, but to share with citizens the progress it's making in delivering safe, efficient, and reliable transit across Maryland with world-class customer service. Input and feedback from MTA employees has been key to the process. MTA Administrator Paul Comfort met with MTA employees at a recent brown bag lunch session to answer their questions and to hear their concerns. 
This month, MTA is set to announce and put into action a comprehensive new transit plan that will demonstrate that MTA has been listening to those who care about delivering a better transit system to Baltimore that area residents deserve. The route system was set up years ago. It doesn't really serve where people want to go today. Some of the routes are too long. There's not hubs there. And so we're taking a fresh look at that whole thing to make sure not only is it operating efficiently and not only reliably, but there's also the right connections. A plan that links city residents to growing job markets in and around the area, links all transit modes in Baltimore to one another more strategically and conveniently, links people to more opportunities, and above all, takes Marylanders to where they want to go, safely, efficiently, and reliably. Coming up next, a look at how the MTA Charm Card is making the commute a little more convenient for those who travel on transit. Stay with us. The last thing you want to have to deal with during your busy trip to or from work or travel on transit is to worry about having correct change to pay your fare. The MTA has an answer for that, and it's called the Charm Card. It's a hassle-free way to pay your fare, and Scott Corbin of the MTA Fare Collections Division joins us with more on the card and how it works. Hi, Scott. Thanks for joining us today. Hi. Thanks for having me. So tell me the Charm Card. When people don't have that exact fare, tell me a little bit about the card and you know why it's something good that our riders would want to consider. Well, the Charm Card is a, a plastic credit card sized card that can hold stored value or past products. And you don't have to worry about exact fare. When you use the Charm card it, card, it automatically uses that past product. Or if you don't have a pass loaded, it can deduct whatever your fare is okay. automatically. And how long has the card been around? We launched the card in 2010, okay. so five years. Okay. So if someone wants to get their hands on a charm card, how would they go about getting one? Do you just go into the station or? No, you can purchase them at the MTA Transit store at 6 okay. St. Paul Street. Um, several of the CVS and Giant stores in Baltimore City have the cards. You can also okay. order them online by visiting the MTA's website and going to the Pass Store section and look for the link to order a charm card. Okay. So how much does the card cost? I know you said that you can store some you know, different amounts and products on the card, but roughly how much does the card cost? Um, at the transit store and online at the MTA store, there's no charge for the card itself. Oh, okay. um, you just pay for the, the value that you have loaded onto the card mm -hmm. at the transit store. Online, when you order it through our website, you can purchase it preloaded with $10 in stored value, a seven day pass or a 30 day pass. Oh, okay, okay. So do you find that many people have responded well to the Charm Card? Is it something that people are finding? We find that the, the people that, that use the card really like it. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a challenge getting people to start using it because they're used to okay. using the old magnetic tickets. But oh, once okay. they get there, they seem to like it. It's okay. much easier, it's more secure, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's hassle-free. You can actually set it up so that you can do auto loads online where you register and set up an account, and mm -hmm. the card, you can have it set to automatically reload your pass product. Uh, before it expires or to reload stored value when it reaches a certain point. Oh, okay. Now you mentioned about storing value on the card or the products, should I say. You mentioned seven day or 30 day. Now, would you have those both stored on the card or you have an option of one or the other? You can store one or okay. the other or both. Oh, um, okay. So you can have mm -hmm. both. Okay. That sounds pretty good. So do the cards ever expire? No, the cards don't ever expire. Um, if you load them with value, the value is there until you use it. Oh, okay, great. So how are you getting, I know you said you're trying to get more people to use the card. What is MTA doing to, you know, do, is there a way to get people to test the card? How, how are you getting more the, people to move? Well, the card's fully operational right now. We've uh, we've done a couple things. We when we had the uh, celebration, we had a commemorative celebration card mm -hmm. that went out that came with ten dollars uh, stored value loaded on it, and just through advertising and word of mouth, we're trying to get the word out and hopefully people see the value in the card when they use it. Okay, and it can be used on bus, rail. 
Any mode? It can be used okay. on all of our local services, metro, subway, light rail, and local bus. It cannot be used on the commuter bus or the oh, marked okay. train. But you can also, once you get to D.C., you can use it on D.C.'s metro and several of the, uh, the regional partners, uh, the, the feeder systems that go into D.C. You can oh, use okay. it on their buses. That sounds good. Now, you mentioned D.C. They have a similar card to what we do, what they we have do. in Maryland? They have the Smart Trip card, and the Smart Trip card is basically the same as the Charm card with a different wrapper. Oh, okay. Um, it is important to note that our pass products cannot be used in D.C. So if you buy a seven-day pass, that won't work in, in D.C., but you okay. can load stored value, and the stored value can be used to pay your fare in D.C. Okay, and again, you said that's something that can be done online. So I do it online. I'm at home. I put value mm -hmm. on my card. Will it automatically register when I get? You have to set up an account first to do it online. Okay. And then it'll take a day or two for the, the value to actually get to your card because mm -hmm. the card's actually, the value is actually loaded on the card. It's not like a regular credit card that has an account in the back end. Okay. Um, you can also load value at all of our ticket vending machines. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have access to a ticket vending machine, you can ro load value right on the fare box up to $20. Okay. And where is the transit store located? It's at 6 St. Paul Street. Okay. Uh, down, downtown, downtown Baltimore, Baltimore, right on the corner of Baltimore and St. Paul Street. Oh, okay, great. So people can just stroll in there, pick up a card, and mm -hmm. then once you have it, you can go at home, library, wherever you want mm -hmm. to load the value, yep. and then just give it a couple of days, and then you're able to use the card. Mm -hmm. And we also have a window there where they can lo load value, and we have two ticket vending machines in the lobby that you can use to load value to the cards. Oh, okay, great. So if someone wants more information, how can they... They can Find visit our, our website. Card. It's w, uh, www.mtacharmcard.gov, mm -hmm. and that has all the information on the Charm Card. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us on Commuter Connections. MTA has a lot of dedicated transit professionals that keep its trains and buses running reliably each and every day. On this edition of the program, we introduce you to a special member of the MTA team who works within the Metro Subway Division. Meet Leonard Stepney, MTA's new acting manager of the Metro Operations Control Center. I've been an employee at MTA for 27 years. I, I started as a part-time bus operator and just worked my way up and uh, started about three weeks ago to a month ago as the manager, acting manager of the Metro Operations Control Center. My main focus is to oversee the Operations Control Center for Metro. Um, I oversee uh, 15 controllers who, on a daily basis, they uh, control everything about the main line, from Johns Hopkins to Owens Mills, from traction power to setting signals, troubleshooting trains to uh, station issues, everything. And it's my job as manager to make sure that the controllers have all the resources that they need. Outside of the MTA, Leonard takes every opportunity to showcase his performing talents. I'm a very active member of my church. I sing on several choirs. I sing on the mass choir and also sing on the male chorus choir. Uh, one thing I am really passionate about is acting. Uh, I, I love the stage. Uh, I have an upcoming event coming up in December. Uh, it's called the My Big Fat Ghetto Fabulous Wedding. I'll be playing a father who has a son that's getting married, and his budget for the wedding is less than $1,000, including the reception. So <laughs> it's a wedding that you don't want to miss. Uh, I've done other stage plays, including The Teacher's Lounge, which starred Deatra Hicks, one of Tyler Perry's actresses. My choir and I, we did an episode on House of Cards, uh, which will be uh, airing shortly. And also did Discord in the Choir, where I played the main character, uh, the Reverend Wright Just, it was one of my most major roles, I would say. And also, uh, Discord in the Choir is, is a play where I've actually met my wife. With a variety of performances under his belt, Leonard has one annual part that he just can't refuse. Actually, one of my favorite roles was playing Santa Claus for MTA. The controllers, we used to adopt families every year, and one of the little girls, she wanted a It's Alive doll. And when we were giving the gifts to the little girls, uh, she basically threw it to the side and jumped in my arms and squeezed me and said, I love you, Santa Claus. And that's why I continue to do Santa Claus every year for, for MTA. Whether it's a lead role in a play or a lead role at the MTA, you can count on Leonard to give it his all. Coming up next, a trip to Maryland's B&O Railroad Museum. 
stay with us. Maryland has a rich rail history and it's all chronicled on display at the B&O Railroad Museum. The museum is a great place to visit and an exciting place the entire family will enjoy. Joining us with a look at what you'll find there is B&O Museum's Chief Curator, David Shackelford. David, thank you for joining us today. It's great to be here. The B&O Railroad Museum, that's an awesome place. Tell us a little bit about it and how it all came to be. Oh, sure. Uh, the museum has a rich history because, of course, the B&O Railroad has been synonymous with Maryland and with Baltimore. Uh, the railroad dates back to 1827. It's one of the first railroads in the country. And uh, through its history, uh, very early on, they decided to save many of their historic pieces. And that would form the core of a collection of a museum that would be basically introduced by the railroad in, 19, in the 1950s. And that's the core of our collection. And uh, basically what we do at the museum is we have about 200 pieces of rolling stock. And we pretty much tell the history and how the history of railroading in America uh, intertwines with the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland. Wow, so you're getting rail cars from all over. Oh, a lot. Of, um, we have a huge collection, a huge oh, collection. So what would you say is your biggest attraction right now? Uh, well, our biggest attraction, it's kind of hard to say because there's some people who like the trains. So they just mm -hmm. want to come down and they want to see uh, where our strength is, is our 19th century railroad steam collection. And it's second to none. Um, but we also have a lot of families that like to come down to the special events that we have, whether it's our Christmas exhibit mm -hmm. uh, or our Easter activities, or they want to come and visit with a day out with Thomas. Oh, um, so okay. we get a nice cross-section of those who are interested in history and those who are actually want to bring their families down and have a good time. That sounds mm -hmm. great. So how many people would you say does it take to run that place? Because that's a pretty big operation that you have over there. Yeah, we have 40 acres and uh, five historic buildings, and mm -hmm. we do run a regular a regular railroad. So that whole operation, we're able to do that with probably about 40 people. Uh, the majority of those, okay. I'd say 30 are full-time, mm -hmm. and the rest are part-time. And then we have a core, a hardcore uh, docent population of this, uh, volunteers that's probably about uh, close to 120. And they help oh, wow. keep the site going. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. And I guess, again, train lovers, so they don't mind volunteering and helping Not out. Not at right? all. Not so at do all. people, if you visit the museum, do you get to actually ride the trains or walk through them? Well, when you come down to the museum, there's lots to see and do. And it's mm -hmm. really, you kind of have to plan your day. Uh, those who have young kids that really love trains mm -hmm. can end up spending from four hours to some who will spend a whole day. So it really wow. kind of depends what you want to see. Uh, we offer train rides on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, check our website for information. It'll tell you the, uh, the times that the train run, the cost, uh, and we'll also tell you what special events we have coming up so that you can plan appropriately. And then uh, basically just come on down and check us out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So roughly how many people would you say visit the museum each year? Each year we do every we do anywhere from about 150 to 200,000 visitors a year is what we do. Oh, quite a few mm -hmm. people. Wow, and I'm sure a lot of those are children. Lots of children. Lots okay. of children and lots of school groups. Now mm -hmm. I understand that MTA has a bit of history at the museum. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the mark trains that are on display. Sure, we have several uh, mark trains that are on display right now. Uh, one is the Mark 7100, which is actually a cab controlled unit uh, that was refurbished off of an old F unit, which is your very 19, very typical 1950s diesel freight engine. It's really mm -hmm. neat. Uh, we have what we have now renamed the Royal Blue. It used to be the Mark One, which was a round end oh. observation car from the New York Central. Mm -hmm. And all of our passenger cars that we use for for our train ride yeah. uh, started out as Mark coaches and they were donated oh, okay. to us in Mark livery and we've basically we've refurbished them and repainted them in a B&O inspired paint scheme and that continues to provide service for all of those who take train rides today. That's great. Mm -hmm. So you know with maintaining these trains they have a lot of history like you said mm -hmm. some date back quite a while. How do you keep them, you know, how do you manage the upkeep? And you mentioned painting and sure. do you have to be careful because if these are older cars, handling yeah. them a little differently? Oh, it's, it's interesting because one of the things, uh, as a lot of your viewers may know, back in 2003, our roundhouse roof collapsed. 
right. and did a lot of damage on the collection. That. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we were able to do out of that is take some of the insurance money and open a restoration facility. And that oh, okay. building, it's the big red barn that's close to Carroll Park. Mm -hmm. And down there, what we're able to do is maintain our operating fleet of diesel and steam engines, our passenger coaches that we use for the train ride, and actually do restoration on the historic pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, each piece presents its own challenge, and there's always something new that you'll find, whether it's uh, how they attach the pieces together to right. the, uh, the layers of paint that you find underneath. But having that facility has saved the museum a significant amount of money that we're able to put back into our operations. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the holidays, so with Christmas coming up, what, yes. is, what would a visitor see there at the museum? But, uh, for us, holidays, especially in Maryland, most people think about toy trains under the, yes. under the tree, mm -hmm. have your own train garden. Mm -hmm. So for many years, we've done uh, what we call the Holiday Festival of Trains, where we would have different model train layouts every weekend. Mm -hmm. Now this year, uh, this just this past year, we changed it slightly. Now we're calling it the Magical Holiday Express. And basically what we do is we all we still have those groups come down. Um, but we also have more activities for family that are family friendly, more right. for the kids to do. Uh, and each weekend is a themed weekend and it's worked out really well. Now brand new this year, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, uh, we are doing the Polar Express. So uh, check okay. us out online because there's limited seating available for this and we have okay. 15 trains that we're running the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday after Thanksgiving, and it's gonna be a huge event. So if you're familiar with the book and with Tom Hanks, yes. this is a great place to bring your kids to experience that. That sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. So what is the cost for the museum? Cost, what I would say is it's gonna vary depending upon your age. Mm -hmm. So the best thing to do is check out our website at www.borail.org. And again, you can find out everything from your ticket admission to rail prices mm -hmm. uh, to special events. Best place to go for information. And your hours of operation. Hours of everything operation. Everything is there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. That brings us to the end of another Commuter Connections program. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Take care.